Uh, in your talk earlier today, you were talking about the British and the Americans could have um, reached some, some kind of constitutional settlement for, to keep the Americans within the British Empire. What do you think that uh, settlement could have looked like? And um, before you answer that, if I can answer a second question as well, Yuri, when Hollywood makes a film of your life, who would you like to be the starring actor to play, to play you? I think that we are losing the cultural war in the sense that you read the microphone, please. And the question was about Hollywood, when Hollywood would become a socialist. And uh, I don't see it in the future. I mean, I'm kind of pessimist about, about any, um, um, any winnings in the cultural war uh, pretty soon. Because if you will look at what's happening in academia, what's happening in, in mass media, in, in Hollywood, it's uh, well, hopefully one day they will make it anyway. Good. Hopefully they will make the film one day. <laughs> okay, so Sean. When they film my life, I'll Brad please. Okay, what, what solution could be on the table? The short answer, I think, is none at all. Um, the Americans were making a claim which was not in itself unreasonable. The British ruling class could not regard that claim as acceptable. Uh, and so um, uh, the only real outcome without a war would simply have been what happened after the war, which was a, a full grant of independence for the Hollies, or, or, or a series of grants of independence. Um, this is a problem that any constitutional state faces when it is also an empire, and, and when it is an empire of settlement rather than of conquest. What do you do with your um, fellow citizens who live a long way off? And the answer, as far as the British were concerned in the 20th century, was to give them uh, full parliamentary institutions, and then for the parliament of Westminster to say, we will not legislate uh, for any of your internal purposes, and then just let them drift away. So, but this is something that required the experience of losing the American colonies, and also a great deal more self-confidence in the British constitutional structure. In, in the 18th century, there was no precedent for this, and so um, maybe if the American colonists had been more sensible, maybe if the government in London had been more sensible, independence could have come about gradually by um, negotiation. But I can't really, give, given the facts on the ground, see any alternative uh, but a bloody and long war between Britain and the colonists. Thank you. Okay, I have a question myself for Paul. Um, I was thinking during your speech, why is it that the left is always winning? Um, what makes them so strong? And uh, you were saying that uh, you think um, the uh, West, or the, the left will continue winning in the West until it's depopulated and repopulated by a different people who are resistant. Uh, now, why, why would these other people be resistant? And I think it's because, uh, or I think, uh, from, from the left again, the left have a goal. They have a goal, and, and, and that is why they are always winning. Where against the non-left, who have not got a goal as such as, as a utopian goal, something to strive for. Um, so what makes the other people resistant is probably that they have a, a different goal. Yeah, I, I like your story that. Um, can everybody tell me? Um, I, I agree that the left is a goal, the right is, uh, or the non left is divided. Um, they do not have the same teleology, um, except insofar as they become part of the left, which I think is the secret of the neoconservatives, because they are part of the left. And they share the teleology. Um, and I, I, I think that the right simply represents, the, the true right represents simply. The, the ineffective forces of resistance. Now, what exactly makes the left acceptable? 
I think there's several things. Well, one of which is their ability to draw on a Christian worldview, um, which in some sense they denature, they distort, but the, the themes of universalism and equality are to, at least to some degree inherent in Christianity. Um, and they are a successor to Christianity who are not going back to paganism as historically impossible. What they're doing is they are sort of butchering Christianity. They're taking certain ideas that are usable and still have purchase, people will people accept, um, and they are recycling them. Um, but they're already something that can be recognized. Uh, and they're seen as the nice guys of Christianity, and they are strongly supported by liberal Christians throughout the West. And even the conservative Christians have a second thoughts about what the left is, is, is doing. The other thing is that the modern uh, welfare state is so powerful, um, controls culture, education to such a degree that everybody is raised within the system of the modern, uh, the modern state. Uh, I, as I said, I, I was very interested in um, uh, Professor Yannello pointing out to us the, uh, that the Italian sociologists uh, emphasized politics, which is also the libertarians do as being the most important aspect um, of power relations um, in the modern world. And it's absolutely correct. It's not economics, it's the state. Uh, and the state is able to influence people in a way that it could not centuries ago. There's no such thing as the state throughout well, history, the state is a modern invention. Um, and democracy has made it much stronger than it was before. Uh, and the state, I would say, is necessarily leftist, or has been necessarily leftist. Um, since the fall of fascism, um, and since the failure, one might say, of something like a Catholic welfare state in Europe, uh, that the only model of the state you have is a leftist model of the state. Um, and as long as the state becomes powerful, any kind of traditional society will become weaker and the left will move from one triumph to the next. Uh, for about a quarter century now, we had a Supreme Court which would have four predictable votes on one side of uh, many domestic issues four predictable votes on the other side, and one kind of swing vote, kind of wishy-washy vote. And, and, and this was true back in the days of Saturday O'Connor, and it's true uh, today with uh, Anthony Kennedy being the, the swing vote. Um, and, and, and the issues might be, uh, uh, can we have eminent domain uh, for a, a taking that's for private use? Uh, we could have uh, oh, uh, affirmative action, race preferences in public institutions. It always ends up five to four, whether, whether it be the current court or the court 15 years ago. Um, we can imagine cases coming up in which the vote would, would be the same way. Like we could have a vote on birthright citizenship maybe in the next five years. We could have a vote on um, whether states can, independently of the national government, um, uh, implement measures which are second best to actually enforcing their own borders with Mexico. So, um, and we can again imagine that the vote will be five to four, but we don't know which way it will go. And there's a whole series of decisions like this expected in the future in which we, we've had in the recent past. And I was wondering if, and, and I'm particularly, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sure Paul and Tony will speak to this, but I'm actually interested in what Yuri would say. Do we have, really, on the Supreme Court, a traditional differentiation on domestic issues between right and left? There's no way that, I'm, I'm, what I'm claiming here is, no, the left has not taken over the right. You can see it. They actually made references to the Commerce Clause, delegation of powers, separation of powers. So you have these traditional issues that define that from an egalitarian, egalitarian, egalitarian point of view in state intervention, right versus left. So do you see it there? Right. 
Yeah. So, so, but the question for me? <coughs> also, Paul and, and Antonio. Yeah. Right, well, it's super important. There's a mix of factors, you know. It's, it's really unpredictable uh, 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 what they do. Um, they did some, some good job, I think, in the last three years. Um, some of them, I, I, it's just difficult to say. I mean, if, if, if this candidate would, 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 uh, would be gone and then we'll be able to cover that up on the change, then I'm thinking that that's what they would do. They, then they would uh, nationalize everything through eminent domain, and then they, that's, that, that's another threat. It's, 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 it's not a part of, of a big government. So, so um, they have some. Uh, I was just uh, recently at the University of Chicago listening to to Judge Thomas, who, um, uh, who unexpectedly turned out as a, being a very nice stand-up judge. He was a kind of like a stand-up comedian, and uh, he uh, a great sense of humor, and was pleasantly uh, surprised. But yes, it's unpredictable. I think that the future is unpredictable, like bastards. <laughs> <laughs> I, I probably would say something uh, that is gloomier because I suppose that's my, my melancholy personality. Uh, um, but but the, it seems to me that at some point you're going to get the five liberal judges, liberal in the American context, not in the European context. Uh, Obama may, uh, probably will win re-election uh, given the, the stupidity and the ineptitude of the Republican Party. Um, and when he does, he'll be able to name at least one, one more judge. Uh, the media will applaud whatever he does. Um, and by then, the, the state and the media will have managed to construct a new uh, majority opinion on I mean, whatever, whatever they're, 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 they're going to have to vote on. Um, uh, so I, I do think that in the end, the liberals will probably, or the left will, have, um, uh, be able to get that into a majority on the Supreme Court. But, but you do concede there is the traditional left-right. It's very clear which is which on the Supreme Court. Well, yes, I mean, you, you, I would say what you have is a party of resistance that does not want to go any, any further, right? Which is what the, what the right is. It, it is simply an obstacle. It's a force of resistance to, um, to, to uh, leftist agendas. And thinking about those on the left who want more social engineering, um, who want more alternative lifestyles enforced by the state, of course, um, and need less than freedom of property or rights of property. Um, and I think that side is probably going to gain ground in the next four years. in their constitution increasingly tiresome. I, I can accept that um, if you have a written constitution and it seems to make certain clear guarantees of um, uh, uh, restraints of power, then it should be used perhaps for, um, for purposes of uh, getting the people on side. But um, I, I don't think America has reached a point where the real constitution is by which the authorities can do anything they like, when they like, uh, so long as it does not bring on armed rebellion, and so long as they can persuade uh, a number of uh, very expensive lawyers to argue that black is white in front of a reasonably sympathetic panel of judges also appointed by the American ruling class. Uh, and, um, when people on the right of America jump up and say, this is a misuse of the Commerce Clause, why? It says very clearly here in the Constitution that A is A. Well, that may be so, but it doesn't mean anything. Uh, and, and perhaps the right would stop losing if it began to argue on the substantive issues at stake, rather than simply relying on the Constitution, a, a paper shield. Another question for Sean. Your choice of words seems to suggest that the American insurgents being reactionary as opposed to progressive uh, should be considered a flaw 
Uh, now, I was reminded of uh, Peter Drucker's interpretation of the American Revolution, which she does not see as a progressive revolt against tyranny, but as actually a conservative counter-revolution against the rationalism of enlightenment. So I'm wondering if you identify any actually reactionary sentiments among uh, the American revolutionaries which may be considered praiseworthy as such. Oh, um, the American Revolution was in its own terms a preserving revolution, but there is no doubt of that. Uh, I, I think the only thing I would have to say against most of the American revolutionaries is that uh, looked at from an English point of view, these people were looking through the wrong end of the telescope. But they, they just didn't understand the situation in England. And indeed, in some of the claims they made about George Perkins' ministers, they appear to be very close to uh, barking mad. Uh, I think, was it Richard Hofstadt who wrote an essay about the paranoid strain of American politics? Well, I, I do see it among many of the uh, Americans who resisted the British uh, in, the city, in, sorry, in the 1760s and 1770s. They, they persistently misunderstood everything that was coming out of London. And uh, although we can all accept that the British government was partly stupid to press on with those taxes when it didn't need to, um, the colonists themselves were highly peculiar. I would actually like to address this point because uh, I agree with Sean. Uh, although I respect the framers of the Constitution, uh, I think the people arguing in favor of the revolution sounded like lunatics very often. Um, and the, uh, 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 obviously there was hysteria, uh, particularly in England, uh, when George III graciously granted religious freedom. Um, and political rights to the Catholics in Quebec because this was the first uh, step uh, so one might have gathered from the Englanders to, to establish a Catholic absolute monarchy in England and extend it uh, over the American colonies. Um, this is not unusual rhetoric uh, among the people who made the revolution. Um, so one can be grateful that it turned out as well as it did. Uh, the other point is there seems to be a hatred of monarchy uh, for a long time on people who view themselves as American patriots. Um, I find this stupid and distasteful. And it most recently manifested as, uh, by the way, the, many of the Americans who uh, petition the English government, petition the king, they support the king against parliament. They are aware that the, that the king will come to their aid, or might come to their aid, and they're appealing to his executive power against the parliament, which they know full well at the time of the stand back was responsible for what they considered a grievance. But afterwards, anti-monarchical sentiment takes over. And um, I found the most egregious expression of this a few weeks ago in the New York Post, in which somebody named Michael Walsh was presented as the voice of conservatism, <coughs> said that the United States is going to defeat the tyrant in Libya the way we defeated Hitler, Stalin, and George III. And you look at that and you wonder what kind of universe this person is, or what kind of historical knowledge this person has. It also was a kind of uh, hysteria whipped up mostly by Republicans um, when uh, Obama bowed his head in front of the Emperor of Japan because uh, this was considered anti-Republican anti and denied American exceptionalism. Um, and uh, this to me is part of bitter aftertaste, you might say, of the anti-monarchical sentiment uh, which plays a role in the American Revolution. Hi, Sean. Um, given what you know about the 21st century, if instead you were living in New England in the 1770s, would you have been a rebel or a red rebel? <coughs> if I had been an American colonist in the 1770s, which side would I have taken? Well, that's a difficult one to answer. Um, you know that uh, about 20% of the American population uh, during the Revolutionary War were loyalists of one kind or another. Um, all right, my answer is that I seem to be emotionally drawn to the most extreme expression of opinions around, and so I would probably be jumping up and down in insisting that uh, 
in insisting that George III was the reincarnation of Genghis Khan and that we'd better have independence yesterday. But it doesn't mean that I have been right. <laughs> This question is addressed to anyone that wants to answer it, but particularly opposite to Paul. Um, Paul, you gave a strong case for um, decadence and ineffectiveness of American conservatives. And although I'm not as pessimistic as you, nonetheless I can see that you can make a good case. But this is a conference of conservative, classical liberals and libertarians. And wouldn't you have to say at the moment that libertarianism is also undergoing a drift leftwards? And, ra and ratifying many of the ideas of the liberal left. And I wonder, first of all, would you agree? Secondly, if you would, why is this happening? And thirdly, what can be done about it? I'm thinking particularly of questions like um, national sovereignty, uh, immigration. I, I have to say, I, I fully agree with you, um, on, uh, on this point as on others. Uh, I do think libertarians in the United States are the hope um, of resistance to the left. Um, I, I think what, what we've seen perhaps for the last 30 years um, is a conservative movement very much shaped by the neoconservatives who have been able to control the religious right. Uh, actually by feeding them Zionism, you know, instead of going to fight for Israel and so forth. Um, and occasionally sort of holding out the idea that they're going to stop abortion or something. You know, they've been very effective the Republicans. And this has been a, uh, mostly an electoral kind of gimmick. Um, nonetheless, the, the libertarians are serious, and the, uh, the neoconservatives ran all over the religious right. You know, I was on, uh, not the religious right, the traditional conservative right, I was on that. We were, we were destroyed, we were marginalized, wrecked. Uh, they did not do this with the libertarians, who seem to have a kind of sustained power and are gaining ground. Um, and I suspect the people who allow Ron Paul and Rand Paul and others on the Fox News are grinding their teeth when they do this because they don't like it any better than the paleoconservatives who the neoconservatives destroyed years ago. Destroyed them as an they cannot do this to libertarians. And part of the appeal, I'm writing an essay on the American conservative for this, I've been thinking this over, but uh, part of the appeal is of the uh, libertarians is they don't have to address social issues, uh, which have an illicit effect and which Republicans are really just exploiting. They really don't do very much with them. Um, what, what Libertarians can focus on are things like uh, bad monetary policy, overreach by the federal bureaucracy, the need for decentralization of power, um, and uh, a critique of what is basically video conservative foreign policy. So, and they've been very effective, and I think that if there's any hope uh, for, for the, the, the American right or to resist the left, I uh, will agree with John, that it will have to come from the libertarian side. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Daniels. Uh, doctor, I have this, this shooting pain going up my arm. I'm sorry. No. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you're. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the uh, Norman Bell, the founder of the British Health Service, who uh, was, as far as I know, the first one to point out that socialised healthcare had the potential to consume the entire national economy if not unchecked. And it looks as if that's what's happening in the United States and other advanced countries. I wonder if, from your own experience with socialised healthcare in Britain, I wonder if you could tell us whether you think there's any solution to the problem of rising demand for healthcare outside the framework of, um, of, of massive state intervention. Is there a libertarian solution? And most particularly in healthcare in general, but most particularly in healthcare near the end of life, which consumes a quite disproportionate amount of our healthcare resources. Is there actually a, a libertarian free market solution to, to this, in your opinion? Um, well, as to your first question about the show, the, the see me afterwards. <laughs> um, to be honest, I, I, I'm not quite sure. With regard to the, the National Health Service, the original <laughs> the, uh, the, when it was instituted, it was thought actually that uh, 
the cost of it would go down because the health of the population would increase so rapidly uh, that the actual expense of the system would go down. Um, I, as far as I'm aware, there is no country in the world uh, where there are no problems with the health system. Uh, the one which is said to be the most satisfactory is France, uh, and it's the only country really where I think people are actually satisfied with it, but the government is trying to rein in the cost of it. And it's a much more, um, oddly enough, it has much more uh, freedom uh, than the national also the British so, um, uh, I think uh, one scheme that I think that you have in America is health accounts, isn't it? Where people are able to save, uh, and that has the potential, I think, for uh, providing a solution. But that's a very long-term uh, solution. There will always have to be an insurance element in it because. Uh, while it is true that most health care costs arise at the end of life, nevertheless they do arise at other times and they can arise at other times in life and they can be catastrophically expensive, so there has to be some insurance element. Uh, so I think that is a possible, a possible way of, uh, of uh, dealing with it. The problem with a completely free health care system, uh, no, sorry, completely um, um, free market of years. And I think we live in, we actually do live in a world in which the first time somebody is refused health care on the grounds that he hasn't saved any money, that he hasn't uh, paid what he should have, he hasn't put anything aside, and so on, uh, there's going to be an outcry. In Britain, we are highly sentimental. So the moment we try to reform any part of the health service or any part of the uh, social security system, hard cases are immediately uh, put up before the public and everyone retires horrified and then does nothing. And I think that is going to be the, one of the obstacles. Financially, I think the only thing is actually uh, more saving, probably. And, and then people uh, paying as and when. Uh, but uh, I don't see it happening, uh, I don't see it really happening anywhere in the world, frankly. If I may add a little bit, um, there was a wonderful article by Hans Hermann Hoppe about healthcare in 1993 in free market. Uh, he put, I think, four points what should be done in healthcare. And it's, uh, the program is so good that I borrowed it for my article uh, for American uh, Journal of uh, Physicians and Surgeons. And I, um, that's an interesting group, and I think all of us as libertarians and conservatives uh, should look into them. It's a, it's a wonderful libertarian group of physicians and surgeons in the United States, existing since 1943. Lou Rockwell was, uh, was uh, a managing editor of the, of the magazine for a while, and they have a wonderful program of what should be done in, in, in U.S. medicine. They have plan A and plan B. Plan A is way more radical than plan B is mostly privatization, privatization, privatization. That's it. Getting government out because that's the source of source of all problems as 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 in, in every other in every other way. Uh, and, um, and people were in the United States are not in line now here, and, uh, and uh, they do a lot of work. It's very very interesting that today is a, is I think it's not only about healthcare; it's about the role of government. That's the government wants to take over uh, the most important. Sometime, some state or some community will say no more to the federal government or some, something will, some opposition will arise and violence might erupt. And the second part of the question is what do you think the army will do if it's called back to suppress the internal population? All right. <clears throat> That's, uh, it's 
very good question. There, uh, early start of the book is, uh, uh, I was on Glenn Becker discussing this book, and uh, I would say we were crazy and we decided for Tom not to criticize the book because, because uh, but the book is pretty flawed if you look at it, right? It's, it has a lot of, uh, yes, uh, it's a lot of compromises, a lot of, uh, a lot of big government propaganda even, I would say. Uh, but in the United States, I, I um, happened to be uh, several times at the conferences on secession. Uh, I think it's called Abbey Hill Institute in Charleston, South Carolina. They have wonderful, wonderful, uh, and, and it is amazing that it's both left and right. For example, they would have, uh, they would have all Confederates there, they would have uh, people who represent something called SPR, which is Second Republic of Vermont, uh, which, are, which are very little wing, and, and, um, and so people are, uh, thinking that this secession would not is, I think that it was kind of like a little bit of setback for this whole discussion because of elections of last year, the Tea Party movement, because because Tea Party is, is trying to get the whole country back, so people are not kind of trying to. Uh, I'm speaking for a lot of Tea Parties because it's very amorphous thing. It's different, not libertarian, not more, it's conservative. It's, it's a lot of people who are concerned with uh, from all of them. And I think that we should, as, as, as libertarians, uh, we should um, uh, uh, address them because they are desperately looking for solutions. And I think this is very, very important for them. So I see that it is, um, uh, while others are trying, also trying to seize that moment. There's plenty of, of, of fights uh, uh, over, over its future. Yeah, I, I perhaps, uh, you know, having expressed some exhilaration in response to John's question, I should point out that at the end of the day, I don't think it would be terms to prevail. Uh, certainly not um, within the two-party system that we have in the United States. Um, the, the neoconservatives and the Republicans, it's a kind of functional compat compatibility. The Republican Party is a big government party, uh, which claims to get government off your back, but by now that's an empty, it's coming, it, 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 utterly empty phrase, but they win votes by saying that anyhow. Um, they have run a very large patronage system like the other party. And any, any concrete ideas for you know, abolishing departments of government, uh, for doing anything that would push us towards decentralization, they will doggedly resist. And of course, the Democratic Party will resist even more. Um, uh, so, so that I, I'm not quite as optimistic um, as, as Yuri. I think that the secessionists represent uh, a kind of intellectual fringe right now. Um, I do think, though, the libertarians can slow things down in terms of the growing power of the left, um, even by attacking public, particularly by attacking public sector unions, which they do now, um, and uh, also for calling for various um, paths toward decentralization of power. What, what does depress me a great deal is a by-election, an American by-election that took place in upstate uh, New York a few days ago, the western part of the state, um, which was a fairly conservative region, um, and uh, conservative, conservative voters did not come out and vote for conservatives. They were frightened that the objection to Obamacare and the support for some long-range, what I think are very moderate cuts, in, the necessary cuts in government proposed by Congressman Ryan of Wisconsin um, might endanger Medicare. And unfortunately, if you scratch beneath the surface of many of our uh, Tea Party uh, demonstrators, they are people of my age who are not much younger who are concerned about their Medicare benefits and are afraid that Obamacare is going to destroy other government entitlements. Um, and uh, this, this indicates to me something I've always suspected, that many of the people who are out on the streets wearing ridiculous wigs and claiming to be, you know, Tea Party revolutionaries uh, were simply protesting what they thought were the excesses of the Democratic administration. Um, and uh, uh, I'm afraid that the revolt may not go as far as we might like to see it go. I think I tend to be a little more optimistic. Uh, I don't think uh, the United States can sink into the dark depths of socialism for the very simple reason that too many people own guns. Um, as far as whether the army can act as an agent of, against, the, uh, against the local populace, if I remember the news correctly, during Hurricane Katrina, the army was used to, to 
to restrict movements in, in ways that were detrimental to many people, like forcing them to stay in one region or preventing them from, from moving to another. Um, however, reports did emerge of soldiers uh, refusing to confiscate guns from private citizens, and that gives me great hope. Um, and I just know from personal experience that soldiers are generally the, the hunters and the, the gun enthusiasts of America. Um, I had one friend who was uh, full of Texas pride, and I told him that if Texas ever breaks from the Union, I'll, I'm going to move there. And he told me, you better come here right away, because as soon as we leave, the first thing we'll do is close the borders. <laughs> um, I think the, the worst, uh, the worst uh, repressions we've seen in terms of like violence against against the U.S. population came during the G20 protests, but that was done. I don't even know by whom. Was it local police? I don't know where they got all those police, but but they weren't the army. That's not to say there aren't other agencies that might act that way. I mean, that's just because I became a Texan uh, patriot. Uh, Texan legislature filled with this Republican guys. Uh, just passed a law uh, which allows people to carry guns on university campuses. So I, as a professor, can come with a big gun and take a big amount of attention and divide the attention of my students. So it's amazing. And students can also say something. I think our society is a polite society, and that's a, that's a text of every standard. Could just say, I think the uh, possibilities for violence in Europe are very, very considerable, um, probably much greater than, than in the United States, uh, because uh, uh, we can already see increases on a kind of constant uh, low level violence, and it has hardly begun yet. Um, so, and as, as we know, in France is quite capable of erupting into violence. And, uh, I think any serious attempt at reform is going to uh, evoke violence because what has been done is to set so large a proportion of the population against so large another proportion of the population. Uh, so I think the possibilities in Europe are very great, but including in Britain. Um, this is a question for Roman. Uh, first of all, thank you for a beautiful and inspiring talk. Um, my question is, um, men do not die for a sacred cause, but a cause becomes sacred because men have died for it. And I, I mean, for instance, the objection if you say that you are against democracy, people will tell you, well, how can you be against democracy? because so many martyrs have died for it. So you are entrapped by their graves. Do you see a future where no cause will be sacred, but simply something that we value over other things? Oh, I'm sorry, we're not what was this? That no cause would be sacred, that would, by the etymology of sacred, that would require a sacrifice. Sure. But it would be simply something that we value over other alternatives. Uh, you express that very beautifully about causes becoming sacred because people have, have died for it. Um, I think that's I think that's perfect perfect expression of, of reality. I've been living in Ukraine for the past uh, eight months, and there I'm always shocked to see statues of Lenin in neighborhoods and cities called the the Dzerzhinsky neighborhood, um, and they also. It's also the, the same impulse, you know, people who know nothing about their, their own history uh, just know that people fought under this flag and, and died with these, with these icons above them. Um, and that's, that's what makes them holy. And uh, there's a lot of tension, for example, in Kiev. Uh, the, some nationalists blew up the face of the statue of Lenin. Now the Communist Party has a little tent there in the guards 24-7. Um, so I think this situation can be diffused, and, and I think this speaks to your question as well, just by letting those expressions be voluntary, let history be interpreted on a, on a voluntary basis. It's only, for example, when government controls all the schools and we're forced to fight one another, was this cause holy or was that cause holy? But I think there's
there's ample room in the free market for people to, to revere whatever they want to revere. The only time that people fall into tension are when the government becomes the arbiter. What is your personal experience? What is the best way to, uh, to fight an army? What is your experience? Gosh, the best way to fight an army? That's a difficult problem. Um, um, there's, there's a lot written about guerrilla warfare, and I feel, I feel a little unprepared for the question because the, the volume of literature on this subject is, is vast, but there are many historic examples of uh, partisans being more effective than, than regular armies. Um, there's one historian, I forget his name, but his whole thesis is that the South lost the, uh, the War of Secession because they insisted on fighting as, as mass armies, whereas it was on their own turf and they, they had all the advantages that, that guerrillas usually enjoy. So, so I do think uh, that's the approach, but it's hard to imagine also, and. The last essay in, in the book, Myth of National Security, by uh, Guido Holtzman makes this point very well. It, it's hard to imagine a libertarian society, um, it's hard to imagine a, a government being able to rationalize the invasion of a libertarian area, uh, at least a foreign government. You can, it's more easy to imagine like the the, the ones you're trying to secede from will invade you, but a foreign invader would really have little reason to go into a, a libertarian area, although that, maybe that's more of an American perspective than a, than a European one. Um, if I can wait, I haven't fired a real government for over 10 years, uh, and that may not be an entirely legal act for it. Um, my understanding is that um, it is that a guerrilla resistance only works when the um, when the invading army is unsure of its mission, or, or when there are divided councils at home. I'm not sure that any of the insurrections, any of the uh, guerrilla insurrections in occupied Europe during the Second World War, were particularly successful. The, the Germans held down Yugoslavia and Greece without serious uh, difficulty. I, I don't think the French resistance was more than an occasional nuisance. The Germans meant business, they had uh, firm leadership at the top, and they were not greatly inconvenienced by these uh, guerrilla uprisings. Uh, the reason why the Americans and British lost in Iran it is not necessarily because of, of suicidal teenagers blowing themselves up um, at checkpoints. I, I think it is that, plus the fact that uh, so many people in the home countries were against war in the first place, and I, I suspect, I, I wasn't there, but I suspect many of the soldiers in Iraq were also wondering, well, why are we here? What is the mission? What, what is the objective? Uh, and when you have that sort of uncertainty, then of course, um, armed resistance by the civilian population can have a big effect. But, but uh, if you have an invader who knows what he wants and means business, then um, I don't think there's much that you can do. There's a quote from Mao which says, if any had been a French colony, Gandhi never would have been an old man. And that's the, to support the basic argument. It's basically the will, how, willing is, how willing is the back home, how the people back home willing to slaughter the world. And that's the, that determines the effect of this in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you go back uh, about a half century now, uh, Enoch Powell uh, was somewhat of a classical liberal, uh, anti-immigration. And if you go, I guess it's about five or ten years ago, when uh, Fortune was assassinated. Fortune was, um, I think, pretty liberal in the European sense, uh, anti-immigration. Now, I understand that uh, the National Front uh, has, uh, with the passing of the baton to the daughter of the leader, has become outright statist left, uh, not in the 
totalitarian sense, but outright status. So you have this, this unfortunate mixture of anti-immigration and socialism, which I think that was a very popular position back in the 30s. And my question is, is that, this is just a few instances that I gave you, is that a general drift? Um, maybe Nicola has answers. Is there a general drift that the anti-immigration party said, so that's an anti-immigration party, it's going to be actually within the political spectrum of this country more statist on other issues, regardless of what you consider anti-immigration, pro-immigration, where you are on that, on other issues, is that party going to be more socialist or less socialist than the rest of the spectrum? My response is depends on how hard they want working class votes. <clears throat> if you want the working class to vote for you, um, and, and you have to basically appeal to the working class the way the socialists used to appeal to them before the socialists became a young and multicultural party, and uh, that is exactly what the National Front has done. I think at some point the Flans Club may have to do this. Um, I think it's inevitable. Uh, sort of given the composition, uh, the voting composition of these countries, um, and the impossibility in some cases of winning elections and becoming a power, becoming a certain majority power or the largest party within a plurality of parties, uh, unless you do something like this. I always hear people saying, I would never vote for the National Democrats in Germany, or I would never vote for the National Front in England because they are socialist parties. Um, they may not be very nice parties, um, but they're anti-immigration parties that oppose the left on, on many social issues, but which want a working class base, um, and uh, therefore try to appeal to welfare state ideas uh, the same kind of ideas that uh, the Democrats, the same kind of ideas that Pat Buchanan appealed to, right? He wanted a 60 day closing notice. Uh, he, was, uh, he took what I thought were ridiculous positions, uh, and John criticized us too on protectionism. Um, uh, but this was, uh, this was done in order to make his candidacy fly among the working class. He was unsuccessful. But on the other hand, the Front National in France is successful. Uh, I mean, they might they they might become the second party, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, the electoral system. Uh, and the only way that they can raise their numbers is by appealing to this one the working class. Yeah, if I can say something about that, I agree with what Paul uh, just said. In, in the Italian perspective, the party which opposes most to, to immigration is Lega Nord, which used to be the free market movement at the very beginning and in anti-statist party, not only for uh, the reason that they supported the secession of the northern region of the country, but for the fact that they were really free market years. Now they, uh, they, the fact that they, they, uh, the anti-immigration issues rose when they abandoned the free market attitude. So now they are a statist party and an anti-immigration anti party. 